the format today is going to be a little bit different. So what I'm going to do is um, we'll introduce kind of the topic from an industry perspective, how, what we're seeing from CrowdStrike. Uh, and I can only speak towards CrowdStrike. Uh, within our uh, our company and I guess the global uh, global security um, call it initiative yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So when we see, and then we'll, we'll what I'm going to do is I'll introduce a topic, kind of talk towards it. And really, what I wanted to have is have Caspian here with me from an incident response. Is how you know there's a reality of what the industry's saying, and then there's the actual hard reality of what's happening from an incident incident responder side. From that is talking from a recovering CISO, right? So there's there's a manufacturer saying it, there's the guys on the front line saying it, and then there's the actual executives and, and senior executives saying, okay, well, this is my reality. So um, we wanna leave it interactive, we'll leave a little bit more time at the end, because we'd really, really like to get into a conversation with the audience about some of the challenges that you guys have, right? We can say, we can talk about the world or the reality of an 18 minute breach and what that really means, uh, and then re really kind of get down into the nitty gritty of real life and what happens every day. Yes. No. Green. Hey. No. Ooh. There we go. It's working. It changed. Yeah. Perfect. So let me say the game is afoot. Reality today <clears throat> is we have to look at the attacker timeline. So it's not the same as it used to be. Um, we're way more advanced. Way more tools. Uh, you know, you basically have an, an Amazon service for an attack. Right. You can go out and just pick whatever you want, and, uh, and you can launch an attack anywhere from the world. You have nation states. Uh, everybody's well funded, <laughs> and their and their and their their tactics or TTPs have changed. There's a fundamental basis to how they do things, but they change all the time. So how do you stay ahead of that? Global breakout time, <clears throat> as of last year, so December 2018, is an hour and 58 minutes. So that's from an initial breach to lateral move, and they disappear. That's the global. We'll get into something a little bit different later on as as the actual who's the best in the world at doing this and what that really means for for you guys. Um, <clears throat> and it's really around the incident response timeline, right? So with, between detecting, understanding, containing, and eradicating this, you have an hour and 58 minutes. And I guess the question from us, or from myself, and then looking at the team is, can anybody effectively figure that out? Or, you know, can you even find the problem within an hour and 58 minutes? Global response time, just so you know, is 63 hours. That's the average to, to be able to remediate uh, a breach. So when you're saying, go ahead, Caspian. Uh, well. I mean, for me, the short answer is no. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. I, usually people aren't calling us within the first one hour and 58 minutes of a breach. They've only gotten to the point of discovery often after that red marker objective has been hit, and then it's a, oh, this happened, now what do we do? Um, and that kind of leads you into a different territory because you're gathering evidence, you're building a forensic case, and you have to be able to like, you know, go back to boards and shareholders and your clients and often say, oh, yeah, this happened, here's what we're doing. Uh, there are a lot of really good examples of how to handle that. I, I can think of one from Montreal that was fairly recent that you've all probably seen in the news. Right. <laughs> we'll talk about and from a CISO's perspective? Yeah, w what I'd say is, um, like any KPI, it should be a stretch objective. Is it achievable today? No. Um, but it's the reality, and, and to me, if you, if you think about trying to like, know your adversary, it's, it's like a threat performance indicator. Like if I was a bad guy, this is what, how quickly I want to, I wanna, and effectively I want to get into an organization and not be detected and cause damage and move uh, laterally. So from a defender point of view of trying to stop a bad guy, that's the reality you've got to try and stop. Whether or not your KPI is achievable is a secondary question. Perfect. I actually kind of dovetails in well into the, uh, well, first of all, goal line wins. <clears throat> I wanted to bring up Kim, Kim Jong-un's five-year national plan. And the reason why is, you know, Carl kind of hit on it, is knowing who you're going up against. The way at CrowdStrike, the way we see it, is the more intelligence you have, the more you understand about the ad adversary, the better prepared you are to get to that, call it the one hour and 58 minutes. His address, his address to the people this year on January 1st was very different than any other address he's ever done. And it was really around uh, economic development, right? The, the betterment of the people of North Korea, being able to advance, become leaders in the world in technology. Um, he mentioned economy 38 times, and he's never mentioned economy before ever in any speech. The reason why that's important is you need to understand the motivations of your attackers, right? So at the surface, looking at his speech, it sounds, you know, it's quite, as what you'd want your leader to do, right? Focus on the people, focus on the economy. But how do you get that done 
when you're in a rep repressive re regime who has amazing propaganda, probably the best in the world uh, internally, you have the sanctions, you're, you got the South Korea, South Korea, and you've got everybody against you globally. How do you do it? How does that make sense? How do you become an economic leader? How is it possible and why does it matter? So if you look at the Kalima, which is one of the uh, threat actors that we have, and we call, anyways, we call you know, the spoiled child or burglar or part military power. He's really a dirty pirate, but anyways, we'll, we'll leave that. It's really they go on a different w way to get it. They steal it. They're going to steal IP. They're going to steal dollars, right? So that's how you get it. It's very important to understand their tactics when the Kalima comes into your environment, right? It's a nation state. Um, we had it recently with Google. There's another one that passed. So if you're in the Play Store, it's the fifth one in the last 18 months of a valid app actually targeting companies and end users to steal cash. They pass through all the certificates for Google Play Store. And, and just as a side yeah. note, like we get a lot of, I do strategic consulting as well as IR work, yeah. and a lot of my clients would always ask the same question when we were talking about stuff like this. Yeah. Well, what do I have that they could possibly want? You know, and it's, yeah. it's kind of a, oh, well, they're going to come in and steal my passport information? No, no, no. They're, they're there to get money. That's what they're after. And sure. a lot of times when you frame it as what do I have that they could want, you're not really thinking about the defensive parts of this because what you have may not necessarily be the same target that they're after, but it still puts you in a position where you're being breached. It doesn't matter what you have. Your, your stuff is now going to be all over the internet, and that's problematic. Uh, I, I'd echo that. I, th I think one of the jobs of a CISO is to uh, talk in generalities and make proverb quotes uh, with respect to security. So to uh, <laughs> paraphrase, I guess, Sun Tzu and Delphic maxims, it's uh, know your enemy, know thyself, uh, especially know your network, because there's a, an asymmetric advantage of, of the bad guy. And understanding sort of kind of the, uh, where John is getting at here is not just who the threat is and what their techniques and, and practices are, but it's uh, what's their motivation. So doing threat assessments and understanding why, what are your crown jewels and why are people after you and what's their um, intent is as important as sort of um, the kind of generic best practices of security. Yeah, the intent's a big one because you can defend against intent. You can't defend against some unknown cloud adversary who is just, you know, amorphous. Once you know what they're after, though, it doesn't matter if it's something that you think is important. You can defend against that. Correct. And then we'll let it off with the what's his principles of Juche, which is basically independence, right? So being uh, economically independent mil and military, um, that's kind of the, the, the motto of, uh, of North Korea. And when we go back on the propaganda, I mean, they're very good, considering that their national animal is a Pegasus. And uh, yeah, everybody believes that they exist. So anyways, moving on. I want to leave this slide up here. This is the big one. This is the breakout times, and this comes as of uh, March uh, 2019. Uh, and if you actually look at that, Russia is by far the leader in the world. It takes them 18 minutes to bust in and move laterally, and they're gone in your environment. Can you even detect that they're there within 18 minutes? Let's be honest. We, we get asked that a lot, actually. Uh, you know, And the truth is, yeah. You can, you probably can. You're not gonna see it in the 18 minutes that they were there, you're gonna see it after the fact when you get called by someone else and they say, hey, we found your information on the internet. You know, when your uh, EDR systems actually report that there's evidence of lateral movement and you're finding this out. So that 18 minutes right there, and this is unfortunately kind of a theme that I keep going back to with a lot of this stuff is that, is it, it's, it is a good goal. It's a good idea to actually be able to be able, be able to get to a point where you can detect that, but most people aren't gonna be able to immediately. and there's another thing about this, and this is always something that we kind of like joking about, like if they're that good, they won't get detected. Well, there's your answer right there. They are that good, and sometimes they don't, you know? Uh, oh, so many animal quotes uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I, guess, uh, I agree with that um, on the breakouts times and the understanding that the Russians are, say, more superior or, or, or more effective than, than another adversary, but back to the threat uh, assessment of who, who's after you. So I don't have to solve all the animal problems. Right. I just have to figure out, uh, in my company, which one's after me with what intent. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wide, I'm, I'm narrow and deep on figuring out, okay, that's that particular threat, whether it's a panda or a spider or, or whatever, and I need to focus on their techniques. I don't have to, almost like the miter attack vector, I, I need to focus on the most probable use cases and work on those. Yes, all these other people could attack me, but let's talk about the most likely one and try to stop that. 
the second part I would say is what, what used to be like kind of the national threat scaling down to like the anonymous anonymi and um, <laughs> you know the script kitty was that the, the APT had different um, you know advanced skills and, and access yeah. and persistence those days are kind of over and if you think of kind of like the NSA power tools kind of got out in the wild so for 200 bucks a script kitty in, in his mom's basement can get access to those weapons so again yeah. I go back to intent of why someone wants to come at you and and looking at that um, vector a little more than all the all the uh, animals and that's a, and that's a good point right so <clears throat> we put that up there as you know that's kind of the, the, the benchmark of what's going on and you got to realize that Russia that 18 minutes that's a targeted attack yeah. right so that's very specific to somebody so it could be an energy organization that's what, you know and I've seen this over the last two years that I've been at CrowdStrike um, you know, you have, they have multiple affiliates globally. They're in competition all the time uh, to overtake other organizations. Uh, and there's been a few of them yeah, that they have targeted attacks based. So it's basically on them and it, it turns out it ends up being the secretary to the VP of mergers and acquisitions yeah. that gets targeted. Why is that? And it's China, you know what I mean? So, so for, it's, you gotta put the, where the contacts and that's where the intelligence has to come into this to understand why are they doing that? Why was that person attacked? Yeah, but yeah, I was going to say, I think historically, I mean, to dovetail to that, we spend a lot of time talking about stuff like threat intelligence and this sort of stuff. And, and I've been doing security for about 20 years. I may not look like I'm that old, but yeah. uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that when this stuff came out initially, everyone kind of went, no, come on, you know, this is, we're not in an action film. We're not all James Bond here. We're not fighting international spies. Yes, that is true. We are not. However, these are still things that happen. These are still parts of the reality that we're going to have to deal with as people who are doing security in this world because everything is connected and realistically, if it's economically easy for a state actor or pretty much anybody else, and my favorite one here is the spider at the bottom, e-crime, yeah, sure. because that can literally be anybody. Like we, we track our threat actors at CrowdStrike and we actually see these guys and yeah. some of us have gotten to the point uh, handling these cases where we might even know the individual behind it. We're never gonna be able to attribute it back to that one person, but it's kind of like you've developed a signature for this person, and you're just like, oh yeah, here he comes again. Like there's, there's that one guy in you know, his mom's basement in Georgia who is just going ahead and putting out that malware, and surprise, we've got another case. So for me, it's, it's, yeah, get to know your threat actors, get to know these groups, and yes, this does sound a little bit militaristic and a little bit like a James Bond movie. That makes it fun. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're chasing spies all day, that's all. Yeah, I wanna echo on that. It, it, it's Back to intent, right? The e-crime people are, are more of a mercantile group and they do, it's not personal, it's business, right? So it, you, you can't really, um, if you picked a threat, be it the Russians or the, or the Chinese, you still have this other uh, uh, orthogonal approach that just says anyone can, if, the, if anyone wants to get at you, they go through kind of the, uh, the hitman approach, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like I say, they're not, they don't have intent, they're just mercenary. Yeah. And I was watching one of these, <clears throat> our presentation at another uh, seminar last week, and one of our threat intelligence mm -hmm. experts, he focused in on, to your point, to the e-crime. Uh, and I asked him after, because I had to go back in and out, and I said, well, why'd you focus there? He said, well, he goes, the Russians, North Korea, and China, and Iran are usually targeted attacks. He says, the e-crime is interesting, because yes, this has nine hours and 42 minutes, but you got to realize, that's a global deployment. That's not a target attack. He says, that number is more impressive to me than a Russian 18 minute. That's millions and millions of endpoints being affected in under, in under 10 hours. So just food for thought. It's kind of spectacular, really. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one more comment yeah. there. The last time uh, CrowdStrike profiled me, I think I came out on the weasel food chain. I thought it was otter. Otter. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm moving up. <laughs> Trying something Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Cute, yeah. We'll go with weasel. Weasel's good. Weasel's good. Um, so what does that mean? So yeah, survival of the fastest. 11060 rule. And this is kind of how CrowdStrike benchmarks it internally for us. So. It's basically one minute to, 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 to detect, 10 minutes to investigate, the showing, yeah, it is, mm -hmm. and then 60 minutes uh, in order to remediate, contain and remediate this, this problem. And this is the leading organizations in the world strive for this, uh, and it's a constant challenge. I don't know, and Caspian can, can possibly talk a little bit more about this, but for me, I don't, I don't know if we've actually seen any organization get there yet, or they have been there, but they can't maintain it. Yeah. It's a lot. I, I've, I've seen organizations that get close, yeah. and I think maybe there's some people in this room that work for some of these organizations, but I, the thing is that it's not a consistent thing because just the time to detection isn't going to be one minute for all cases. You know, Time to investigate, that's going to depend on what you've got in terms of available people to actually investigate, especially if you're dealing with multiple incidents, which most people are. You know, 
you're not going to be running one IR or one detection. You've got all this stuff that's coming in across your networks because your networks are large and you have massive footprints. So your time to investigate is going to be dependent on the workforces available. It turns into a project management problem, not a hard security problem. But project management becomes a hard security problem when you don't have enough people available. And then time to remediate, it's the same thing. Do you have the expertise on site? Do you have the people there? You know, And this is where, yeah, 11060, that's an ideal goal to strive for. That is, that is like cleanliness next to godliness, if you want to, if you want to put it in that direction. Uh, but there is a lot more going on there that uh, has to be focused on, and, and a lot of that goes outside of the IR process too. Right. So what I would say about the one ten sixty thing is the one I, as a CISO, that's trying to keep his job for more than eighteen months, which is the kind of half life <laughs> of uh, CISOs, um, it, it's the sixty. Right, so yeah. do I care that I detect people infecting me in one minute? Would be nice, but the one that's the killer is the, the 60, uh, because what you find is your current state systems and the people thereof are very, it's not yet real time and not you know, fully um, continuous monitoring. Nor, it's very hierarchical in terms of moving logs up through defense in depth and, and through people in tiers. It's very linear um, in terms of most investigations are very non-linear. You're going all in, in very different directions. So to s kind of go from current state to future state and hit um, 60 minutes to uh, prevent, I, for lack of a better term, yeah. you, you need to do three things, in my opinion. One is start to prioritize. You can't go after everything and every log. Number two is settle for resilience. Yeah, people are getting in, but so what? Let's, let's talk about the ones that are moving fast laterally. Uh, and the third thing is innovation, right? You're not going to use old tried and true techniques. You're going to have to go analytics and AI and, and whatever, <laughs> right? And the second problem with that is so are the bad guys, right? So yeah. you're into a different kind of space race. It's, I, I feel like, I, I mean, I used to describe this to actually a lot of people, you know, because we all have family that, oh, you work in security. Can you tell me about the latest malware? Well, yeah, malware is like the arms race was, you know. Uh, there's always going to be somebody out there who's doing something that's slightly better, weirder, worse, whatever. Uh, and inevitably, I think, you know, I'm with you on that. Like, it's, it's the 60 minutes that actually count. The one and the 10 are a big deal. Um, and I can tell you from experience, we never get a call in the first 10 minutes. It's that next 60 that's going to make the difference as to whether or not we can even, I mean, from our end, it's going to make the difference as to whether or not we're going to be able to help you out immediately and contain things, or it's going to turn into a longer investigation, too. And this is where the intelligence comes into play, right? Yeah, this is, yeah. This, this is, is where the knowing, yeah. knowing your adversary is very critical. Yeah. To your point, you're not getting that call for at least 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. If so John's really quiet and he's off mic, but he basically said this. Oh, is sorry. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> this is where the intelligence comes in. This is where the intelligence comes in. Comes in. Yeah, yeah, no, just understanding your adversary, really, really knowing who you're dealing with and, and their tactics, right? So we'll, we'll talk about it in another slide, but TTPs will change. They'll, mer they'll evolve over time, but the fundamentals of how they do things remain the same. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, one minute, 1060, we got through that. This is, the, this is an interesting one. So <clears throat> I guess for a good prevention or policy, I guess internally, is really having to um, feed your stakeholders. But you need to identify who those stakeholders are, right? And so and I'll get Carl specifically to start on this one, but from a tactical perspective, from an operational perspective, and then strategic. What does that mean to a CISO? And then transversely, what does it mean on, as far as uh, an in, inside you know, incident response. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll start in the top floor. I, I think the big thing that the tools and the, the new approach can change is kind of what I would call a silo. So you have a really good team environment in a large security SOC or as a CISO even, um, but everyone's in their funnels, right? The IR people and the governance and response people and the, the eyes on glass people, they tend to, they have a silo and they're good at it, but the crosstalk isn't there. And so if you look at how they've laid out the tactical and operational and strategic teams, it's compensating for that, saying we, you should have one of every type of person, ethical hacker, get them all in a room and start to compare notes. And, and now you're, um, as opposed to like building a big data lake and, and kind of getting all the logs and, and, and um, working the data, you're working the insight. So I want to know you guys in UEBA land looked uh, and you guys in EDR looked at stuff and you came up with an idea or an insight, well now let's start sharing insights as a cross-functional team. And, and I'd add there's still a north-south problem, not, not a network one, but a, 
organizational one where, okay, the IR people are down there doing all that and the CISO kind of shows up in a suit and pops in and buys some coffee and asks how's it going. How's everybody doing? All right, exactly. cool, great. It, yeah, keep, keep up the good Problem work. Problem solved, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> you know, and send me the kind of pie chart with the risk analysis yeah. or the, the root cause analysis. I'll go back up to the top floor and explain to them what's going on. Yeah. Well, no, that you got to get in the same situation room and start, yes, outwardly focus and, and talk to vendors and talk, talk upstairs, but be part of that team in a sort of uh, top floor to shop floor. I, 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 do you remember the A-team? You know, the, the show? I pity the fool. Yeah, I, I, this, the CISO is the <laughs> face man to me. You know, when, when, when we're t doing this, we, there's got to be somebody out front. I mean, maybe he's the guy with the cigar whose name I can't remember. But George Papard. There That's we right, go, George, George Papard. Yeah, but there's always got to be somebody there who's actually not only coordinating things in that sense and talking to management, talking to the board and talking to the people that need to be talked to, but also shilling the team so that they can get their work done and bridging all these gaps. Sometimes it's two people, sometimes it's three. Frequently it's just one. Um, and it's a lot of work. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> <laughs> um, from kind of this side and this slide side, uh, you know, I don't just do IR, obviously. I've done a lot of proactive consulting with people. And when we look at silos, and I, I'm glad you used that phrase because it's actually one that I love. Uh, if you've ever looked at a grain silo, they're very hard to destroy. A little bit of trivia for you. Uh, it takes a lot of explosives to take down a grain silo. Um, and I live in Montreal. We actually have a whole bunch of them around the city that we can't take out. Uh, and one of the things about that is, Yes, they're beautiful, but if you're inside one, very little actually gets out of that silo until it rises to the top, goes across, and then comes down to the next side, or you feed it from the bottom. Um, and a lot of what I've seen work well for people is when they've got that crosstalk going on at all levels, and it's not you've got to report up through the chain of command. Yeah, yeah, we have processes for that, and those are important. And from my end, they're extremely important because then I can see that information feeding in, but it's also important that everyone's actually properly communicating. And frequently, I find what holds up a lot of our incident responses is that we don't have that communication. There's stuff that was just never brought to the table you know, earlier on in the response process that should have been, that it comes out later on and we're like, oh, well, I mean, you had that technology there all along, why didn't we just lever it in the, leverage it in the first 10 minutes instead of spending five weeks chasing after this other thing? Uh, so there's elements of this where unifying tactical, operational, and strategic are actually a really big deal for me because I'm often going to be the one person on the phone with one person who has to have all that information and feed it back to us. I think the other thing is that, you know, on the cross-functional teams is it, it goes from bad to worse, right? We're talking about cybersecurity and, yeah. and a SOC. What's happening with, is, okay, there's that that's changing, but there's kind of a perfect storm in technology around, okay, there's IoT, there's cloud, there's AI, and you're starting to say, okay, there's a SOC thing that we all got to get out of silos, but what about the NOC? And what about mm -hmm. all these other things that are traditionally not security? And yet the problem can start out as a performance issue and then migrate over to a security issue. And it's kind of that cross-functional team is, there's not a leader, it's more like you said, a, a school of fish that someone's detected something yeah. and they've seemed to be running with a good idea. And you go, nope. And, and if someone else is taking over. So it's not just a security silo. We used to joke, uh, Joe's here from the, the Bell Sock, but we used to call it the snock, right? It, you can't just have a knock and a sock and <laughs> have things come up and surf one across. You, yeah. you, you're going back and forth on a problem to see, is it just a performance issue or a capacity issue or is it a related DDoS attack, that kind of stuff? One of my prior employers uh, actually had yeah, we, it was at a time, this was a while ago, we didn't, we didn't really have a full security department. We didn't have an IR team. We had a bunch of really talented sysadmins, a couple of help desk folks, and one or two other people who knew what they were doing and liked doing security, and that was who it was. And I used to joke that it was like, you know, they're the IR posse because you only call them up when you need them. Uh, when I was doing strategic consulting, and when I still do this, I refer to this as the volunteer fire department problem. Um, because frequently you're going to be attracting the people who want to do security and you'll get people who should be doing it and frequently I see this on, especially like, I don't want to pick on web devs, but I see that a lot on the, on the dev side uh, where it's a, no, that's not my job. Well, yeah, it's not, but it's also your job to make a product that works or, you know, build a thing that is secure. So yes, it is your job and you're, you're coming with me right now and you should come with me even if you don't want to, trust me, it'll be fun. But I think part of the problem is also getting that involvement from people. You know, you can't make it look like what you're doing is a scary black art and you're a wizard. You have to actually bring them to the party, basically. Volunteer fireman, number one person starting fires. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Got to guarantee you got work, you know? Nice. <laughs> 
and really moving into moving from reactive to proactive. I think we kind of touched a little bit on this, but we you know ended off. We don't uh, another five minutes, and we kind of want to open that up for for the crowd. But really, it's and what what I've come together and 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 everything I've heard today and from every other conference and white paper that I've read is really yeah, you have to enrich everything because context is king. Data is king, right? So without it, it's perfect. For example, one the one minute might work. To your, mm. your point, right? <laughs> the 10, maybe 60, not so much. You really have to understand what's going on. You got to have that information. Behind every intrusion, there's a collection requirement. Understand this and get the resources to build the correct wall, right? And that's, it always goes back to intelligence. It always goes back to understanding that adversary. Who's there? Why are they there? What's the motivation behind it? It's not, don't always take it face value. You got to dig. Yeah. Right? But you got to have that information. This is this is a really big one for me because I I, I had a, an old colleague who after I give this nice talk about all this stuff and I was kind of like yeah you know you can do this it's great she just she was actually I'm seeing this thing and it was a, it was a big client event and um, she's like well well Caspian you know the problem is that none of our clients have a money tree growing in their backyard yeah. and they can't well, just well. defend against everything and the truth is you can't but a lot of times when you approach security especially as a new security person or even when you've been doing it forever we all fall prey to this trap of like, oh yeah, no, everything is on fire, we have to block all of the holes in the dike. No, it's actually important to prioritize and it's important to figure out what the context is and, and you know, what the threats are. Yeah, I, I, I more say an elastic sandbox than a wall, it's kind of a yeah. bend but don't break like approach. <laughs> and I, I'm here with the words, sandbox, right? Like but um, I think for a CISO too, you're, you're uh, back to your point on, on ROI. Up till now, it's always been, give me the money, I'll secure things. Mm. Now it's more uh, be a business enabler. So we can't do everything. Uh, I really want to understand the value for money of adding these additional walls or, or whatnot. And that's, that's the new reality in terms of, um, like you said, one, you're not going to stop everything. You've just admitted that. Number two is we have a spend uh, that the money could go to security or go to cloud or go to many other things in this companies, so explain to me why the next dollar should go here and why it's the best bet. Yeah. So you're getting into prioritization and you're getting into um, where the CISO is not a lone wolf anymore. He's got to deal, he or she's got to deal with the entire board. They're liable. There's other, you know, there's CFOs and CIOs and now you're going to have to work across the C-level suite. Absolutely. I said it before and we'll say it again. Adversaries change and adapt TTPs, but there's still a fundamental consistency in what they do. Right, so that's that's key. You just got to be, uh, you know, it's getting it's like, get, get that important intelligence as to what they're doing now. But the motivations are always the same. So, so he's hit upon a, a spot. I, I I come out of the insider threat Ueba area, and basically the message is you can't talk yourself out of a behavior, right? So yeah. So everybody's <laughs> whether it's playing poker or whether you're a serial killer or whether you're a, a hacker, <laughs> you have these tendencies that you may not even be aware of. Them. <laughs> Sorry for the. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the uh, difference between a serial entrepreneur and a serial killer? A couple of letters? Serial killer doesn't count as attempted murders, but that's ah. just, uh, <laughs> um, came from startups. So uh, my, my, my point there is, is just that uh, even the hacker's not aware of these TTPs. Like, if he's smart, he'd read his own scouting report and go, this is what you do. Um, so you you're much more able to detect quicker, faster, in my opinion, around behavioral analytics than you are anything else about who the bad guy is, what's he doing, what's he gonna do next, because you, you do kind of know that bad guys always have to end up in the worst place possible for them, right? They wanna get the crown jewels, they want to, um, no matter what bad things you put in place to deter them, they're gonna take the risk. So you can start to, through TTP, start to look for tells and also you know where they're going. Correct. Yeah. And, and doing the attribution is, you know, we're, we talked about doing attribution and there's, you have to take that with a but. Yeah. Right. So just because the TTPs are correct and, and, you know, like you said, it's always about the motivation and understanding kind of what the end game is and going after crown jewels. But it's very easy for an assumption to be made that it's Russia coming after you when the back door you realize <laughs> it ends up being North Korea or or somebody else, right? So you got to keep that in mind as well, right? And that's where all that information, best practice and, yeah. and working with your people, right? I think uh, I, I find this the attribution side kind of interesting because I, I remember I don't know if anyone remembers Sector's attribution dice that they were handing out one year as a as conference swag. Um, <laughs> Some I, people do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I'll, I'll make I'll make wisecracks about this all the time. Uh, the truth is that 
while it's important to know what you're defending against and who you're defending against, ultimately, when they get in and start doing things, it doesn't matter who they were. Right. They are doing things now, and you need to make it stop. So the attribution part's great. That can come later. Knowing what your threats are first, knowing the threat environment, knowing the TTPs, we're going to use that uh, three-letter acronym, but the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, procedures yeah. uh, you know, what color shoes they wear is maybe not as important, but getting to know those threat actors down to a point where you can actually say, yeah, they usually do this. Great. Attribution afterwards, well, I, you know, it gives you a nice pat on the back. It's kind of fun for the story, but it's not 100% it's a validation, necessary. Right? Like yeah, you, it's a validation. You're going through yeah. saying, yeah, we did yeah. the right yeah. process and the, we follow the right procedures to identify that yeah or no. That, I, right. I think that's well put. It, it's not a KPI. It's not a 1, yeah. 10, 60. You find out who the attribution is assigned to, so what? It's important to understand who your adversary is and, and why, okay. but it's not on a timeline. Yeah. And and it's there's no retaliation. There's no, you're trying to remediate. We're, we're not the police. We're not the government. Well, okay, some of you are. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the point is like, Unless you're handing this over to law enforcement, unless legal's involved in a way where it's actually necessary, most of the time, yeah, it's it's handy, but it's not a KPI. Yeah. Right. And then the last is so the silver bullet. Bullet is people, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Well, we'll say you know effective defense. We talked about that, but people are also your biggest. We'll call it risk, mm -hmm. right? So it can be your biggest asset, but your biggest risk, your biggest exposure, right? So I, I think we've all seen that. I have a separate talk I do about this once in a while where I, I talk about doing security and effectively, fundamentally, all security, it doesn't matter if it's cybersecurity or you know, daycare security, you're always defending people in the end. Yeah, because you can talk about data, you can talk about your crown jewels and your assets, but fundamentally, those are always going to be attached to a human being at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It may be a client, it may be your board, it may be your shareholders, it may be you. But the fact is, yes, it's people. It always comes down to people. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And, and I also think it's, Yes, the skilled people in security that you need to better equip, and they're on point for security. I think kind of the security awareness and, and the, not, the lack of recognition that people are also your weakest layer. Uh, that's always gonna happen with social networking and, and um, social engineering, sorry, um, Freudian slip. And, uh, <laughs> um, it's the same I thing. think in a business context, if you're the CISO, you start to realize, yeah, you know, the CIO and the CFO and all their people, they have other jobs, you know, they have finance and, and productivity yeah. and you name it. You're the security guy at the end of the day, and that's why you're on point for a breach. So expecting the rest of the organization to make security first, that's not their day job. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out ways to enable them to do their job and yet be secure, to your point. Think of them as um, people you need to safeguard, not people that are the problem. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, yeah, that's that's my kind of big one. Oh, and yeah, back that's up a, your data. <laughs> Remember, people, back up your data. That would be number two on my list: it's people, data. Yeah, there right there. <laughs> and that's kind of it for our talk tracks. So we wanted to kind of open up the uh, the floor if you guys have any questions. Mm -hmm.